My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Alan Meadows. It is July 29th, 2017. We're outside on the front steps of Nicholson Library at Linfield College. And Alan, we're going to start you off with a nice easy question, which okay. is why wine? Wow. Um, I've never been asked that question Maybe before. not so easy. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I honestly do not know other than I was intrigued from the very beginning. I was for my 22nd birthday. I should back up in the sense that wine had always been on the table. I was um, a 50s, 60s baby, uh, but unusually, especially for a parent that uh, came from the Midwest, we always had wine on the table because my father was a military officer and he was stationed in France. I was there, not that it had any impact on me per se, but uh, we rented half of a chateau, nothing um, major, but <laughs> The old French couple taught my father how to cook, and wine was part of that. And he adopted that. And so unlike most kids of my generation, wine was always on the table uh, when I was growing up. And it wasn't fancy wine. In fact, it was jug wine. But wine was there. Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, it wasn't an unusual concept to have wine, even if it was just a little bit, with, uh, with dinner. And then for my 22nd birthday, I was dating a woman who took me to a nice restaurant and said, order a bottle of wine. And I was like, um, <laughs> I thought, well, celebration, uh, number seven, the champagne, please. <laughs> uh, I didn't know anything about it, but I managed to get out of that one. And so I went, next day I went to the bookstore, um, got a book on wine, just said I should know something about this because chances are she'll ask me to order an, a bottle at some point in the future. And I was just fascinated. Uh, and so one thing led to another and I got a very small inheritance uh, and so rather than going to graduate school I took a year off um, traveled around New England with this woman and uh, found a little tiny liquor store that had an amazing collection of wine <laughs> and so I used to go in on Wednesday afternoon nothing going on and this old man took an interest in me and would suggest things here, try this, try this, try this, and just come back and tell me what you think. And mostly it was Bordeaux because that's what I thought that connoisseur should know about. But he was a real burgundy geek. And he kept saying, trying to say, you know, try this burgundy stuff. And it was like, and one time he wasn't the owner. He actually just gave me a bottle and said, shh, don't say anything. Just go try this, come back, tell me what you think. And so over the course of this year, I got a pretty good education pretty fast. And like I said, I had a tiny amount of money to spend uh, and a really good teacher. And so finally, I decided I should probably go back to business school. And so I went off, but I'd been badly bitten by the bug. And so I went around to every wine store in town, found the one with the best selection and convinced them to give me a part-time job. And so I went to graduate school, worked part-time in this store so I could be around it, uh, convinced the guy to sell me wines at cost. He said, well, why should I do that? I said, well, I, I can't sell what I haven't tasted. So he was like, all right, fair enough. And so that's, I suppose, how things got started. After that, I got my degree, went to, to work for Wall Street, and it wasn't anything uh, terribly fascinating after that other than I was so marked by one bottle of Burgundy that I said I've got to see the people in the country that created a form of beauty that I had never seen before. So I packed my bags when I got my degree, went off to Europe for three months and wound up spending two of the three in Burgundy and made a couple of friends there and then I wasn't married at the time so I started going because I had the flexibility uh, to go and one thing led to another and so that's how it got started but it wasn't uh, anything that I suppose was programmed from the beginning it was just a confluence of odd events that uh, led me in that direction. And so how do you get from there to starting Berghound? Well that's a uh, largely because I couldn't stand prosperity anymore. Um, no, in all seriousness, I was then an investment banker up until 97, and then our firm got bought out, and then I got what I thought was my dream job as chief financial officer of a large insurance company, New York Stock Exchange traded, et cetera, et cetera, and it turned out to be a complete and utter nightmare. And so 
I, I finally resigned and was wondering what I was going to do next. And I had in the back of my mind this idea to be a wine critic, but rather than be a wine critic like all the other reviews that try to do Bordeaux, Burgundy, Champagne, Italy, Spain, the US, uh, et cetera, et cetera, I just wanted to do one thing, which was Pinot Noir. Um, but I couldn't figure out how to do it because I said something that specialized, you'll starve. Because you need a production, a print run, that's so large that it wouldn't support it. And when you think about it at the time, um, today it's nothing, but at the time there were no specialized, that the most specialized wine report that existed was California wines. And that was already, people thought, you know, how limiting. Um, but 2000 came along and my wife said, you know, I married you for life, but not for lunch. Go find something to do. <laughs> uh, and you had this confluence of events that happens every so often, which is that more and more people were looking online as a primary source of information. No longer a secondary source, but a primary source. Um, the second thing is that online secured payment was possible. Mm -hmm. Um, it was no longer that thing like, oh, I don't know, it's pretty risky, can't afford to put my credit card details out there. It became an accepted form of commerce. Mm -hmm. um, you put those two together, plus um, the availability of desktop publishing for anybody, you know, Joe Schmo. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have pretty sophisticated stuff available to you for nothing, or you know, the cost of the software, but no big deal. So you could actually start a business that was essentially to be run online for not very much. Um, really, the, the cost of the business itself in terms of the bricks and mortar was maybe 10% of it. The rest of it was actually just the travel, lodging, um, uh, rental car, uh, to spend a lot of time someplace else mm -hmm. um, because France isn't cheap and you do have to be there. Uh, to review the wines. And so I had this concept of we're going to do one thing, but we're going to do it in far more depth than anyone else. And we'll see. Might work, might not. Um, it was far from being a given because, as I mentioned, the most specialized publication around was California wine, which is already pretty substantial in terms of breadth. Mm -hmm. And here I was coming out with this is going to be Burgundy and Burgundy only, and eventually we will add U.S. Pinot Noir. Uh, because that was always the goal in the back of my head. But as I said before, I try that. We'll at least see if, uh, if this works. And I'd had a fairly substantial following on the old AOL wine boards way back in the day. Uh, and that was the other reason I thought, you know, maybe it could work. And then in 1997, uh, the Wine Spectator did an article on me, and they called it Berghound. Uh, and <laughs> so I had a little bit of, I don't know, fame is, is uh, a strong word, but at least there was a community of people who had a clue mm -hmm. who I was and my passion for Pinot Noir. So that helped. But I have to say that uh, the first year I had maybe 500 subscribers. And the idea behind it was even riskier in the sense that it was to be 100% subscriber funded. Mm. No advertisements. I, I did no advertising. I accepted no advertising. The idea was for it to be 100% independent. I would fund it uh, to the extent uh, necessary and after that the pieces were going to fall where they were. In other words, um, as a friend of mine is fond of saying, uh, the sincerest compliment you will ever get is their money. <laughs> um, and it turned out that a lot of people that were, rabid is a strong word, but relatively uh, vocal supporters on AOL turned out not to subscribe. <laughs> you know, they were uh, quite content to receive information for free, but when you ask people to pay for something, that's when you know mm -hmm. uh, people admire what you do or even 
or perhaps less so, mm -hmm. um, put it that way. And, but at the end of the second year, we had a thousand. And you started to say, I think there's a nugget of a business in here, even if I was doing most of the work and I was definitely looking up at minimum wage mm -hmm. uh, for quite a while. <laughs> but after two years, it took off. Um, and the internet enabled me to have a, an international reach. Um, for example, today there are readers in 68 different countries. Wow. That wouldn't be possible with a print-based or exclusively print-based. And just to give you an idea, partially because of cost differential, although we don't make an extra nickel on the printed version, it's just that rates have gone up so much, um, losses, you have to send it again. Mm -hmm. uh, in any event, uh, we started out at about 75% electronic, 25% printed. Now I would say it's 95.5. Uh, in fact, I even tell people, take the electronic, and if you want printed, take your USB, uh, take the file down to Kinko's, and uh, have them print it off for far less than I can send it to you. And on top of which, it's just a pain in the rear end for us to you know, put everything in there, because we're mom and pop. It's not like we're running off uh, 100,000 copies that can be automatically mm -hmm. you know, put in envelopes, um, stripped and sent to uh, the post office or whomever to deliver it. So um, I think it's the wave of the future because when the delivery cost is zero, it's pretty good. It's hard to get lower than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how uh, I went from basically a finance geek to a wine geek. Do you find there are unique challenges in writing about wine? Yes, because you have to decide who your audience is and what they want to know. Um, somebody, um, a doctor friend of mine, Alan, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, can't remember his last name came up with an interesting way of separating wine writing styles, which are um, objectivists and adjectivists. Mm -hmm. And this is his point of view, not mine. Uh, but he, for example, said that uh, Robert Parker was an objectivist, like to describe wines. Um, he put me in the category of being an uh, objectivist meaning that you broke wines down based on their structural characteristics, but didn't spend a lot of time noting whether it was blueberry or red cherry, dark cherry. I put a little bit of that in, but um, writing for the people that I think I write for, um, they want to know how these wines are going to age. Are they approachable young? Will they age? If so, um, what are we likely to have 10 years from now? when they mature. And that has always been my approach. Break the wine down and put it back together like I think it will be or I imagine it will be at some point in the future. And it's a different approach uh, than writing about how the wine is right now. The second big difference that I would ascribe uh, to my approach vis-a-vis -vis certain others is that I try and take style out of it um, because style is not quality. Style is something that you can like more, you can like less, uh, but it is not a qualitative component. Um, now, can you really, the, the pertinent question is, can you really recuse yourself from your own preferences? Probably not totally, mm -hmm. but I find the the critical approach of saying, I like this, therefore it is good. Or, I don't like that, therefore it is a bad wine. Mm -hmm. And I say, to me, that's intellectually bankrupt. Uh, I much prefer to have the flexibility to say, you know, this isn't really for me, but it's well done in its style. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you like uh, slightly higher alcohol or slightly more wooded wines or slightly more extracted wines, um, this may very well appeal to you. That, to me, uh, is an approach that allows me to render more information and therefore be of service uh, to my client than to say, it sucks. 
<laughs> uh, don't buy it. Um, now that I say that too sometimes, but generally because there is some technical flaw. Um, the other side of that coin is I happen to like acidity a lot because I think that it allows you to have things with food and so you have to be careful that something that might seem just a little too bright by itself, mm -hmm. but you put it with food, all of a sudden that brightness is an asset, not necessarily a negative. Uh, so I'll say, I happen to like this a lot, but careful, there's quite a bit of acidity, it may not appeal to everyone. Mm -hmm. And so again, you are taking into account uh, that not everybody reading what you have to say will necessarily share um, a similar concept. All of that said, I think that most people um, subscribe to a critic or, or perhaps multiple critics, but at least one whose taste they share more or mm -hmm. less. Mm -hmm. um, if nothing else, the philosophical concept behind a wine. You never know, though. I had a guy come up in the seminar yesterday uh, saying, you know, your drinking windows are fairly long term, which is true. Um, I like uh, Pinots that have those secondary characteristics. Uh, he said, I like young fruit. And I said, well, in that case, you should pay no attention to my drinking window. Um, because if that's your preference, mm -hmm. you know, why try and make your taste align to somebody else's? And you know, your taste may change uh, at some point because almost everyone's do. Mm -hmm. um, but if your taste happens to be for young fruit, then don't chase uh, my drinking window, which is looking for a secondary aroma uh, at the, as an indicator that it's probably time to start drinking that. So what's your favorite part of writing about wine? Uh, the service part. I mean, I really enjoy trying to help people make sense of what's going on. I mean, you have, in a way, uh, two aspects that keep this intellectually vibrant for me. You've got the old world where the terroirs are pretty well established. Um, certainly in terms of the delimitations, not everyone agrees whether Les Saint-Georges, for example, should be an elegant wine or should it be powerful. Um, so there are certain conundrums where even the producers themselves that make it don't necessarily agree. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, there's pretty good consensus around what the wines are, quote unquote, supposed to be um, when they reflect typicity. By contrast, um, the new world is still trying to figure this out. You know, what does it mean to be Chehalem? Um, what does it mean to be Ribbon Ridge? What does it mean to be uh, Eola Amity? Um, you know, is Dundee always uh, structured as Yamhill Carlton, always got that uh, deep red fruit with a certain robustness? Is, are those archetypes what we should expect? Uh, or is there more exploration to be done? I think there's more exploration to be done, which is why I've consistently been against, be it New Zealand or wherever, um, the the occasional push by growers associations, you know, let's codify our vineyards, mm -hmm. let's recreate the hierarchy that they've done in Burgundy. Mm -hmm. And I have written letters that say that only serves to entrench uh, the interest of those that are known today. If you think after 30 years of prospecting for terroir that you found everything, I think you're seriously mistaken. And who knows whether the selection of clones you used uh, to plant the pieces of dirt that have been found. Who knows whether your viticultural philosophy is the right one. Um, and, and even if all of that is correct, your vines are still only 30 years of age. And if you believe the way the Burgundians believe that it takes 30 to 40 years for the vines to produce their best fruit, mm -hmm. and then if you believe also, as I believe, that it takes 10 to 15 years to see, because the one thing, in my opinion, that all the great wines of the world possess, um, that they share, irrespective of grape variety or region, is their ability to transform and bottle, to become something more interesting with age than they offer when they are young. And if that is true, then you need to add another 10 to 15 years. Now you got basically 50 years before the time that you saw a piece of dirt, and you said that looks promising for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, and whether you know 
uh, whether you got things right or not. But what if it was simply a matter of the clones you used? Mm -hmm. Or was it a question of your viticultural philosophy? Um, I don't presume to know those things, but those are the pertinent questions. Because even if something didn't work out so well, doesn't mean that the terroir doesn't have potential. It may mean that it needs to be farmed differently. Mm -hmm. And so I tell people this, you know, you see the winemakers kind of slump because <laughs> the idea that you know, your, your kids may know, but you're probably not going to know whether your bet was the right one. And what the Burgundians have, and I, again, I tell people this all the time, that what the Burgundians have that you don't have isn't expertise, it's not passion, it's not money, it's not even access to the playbook, because the Burgundians gave the world the playbook. You know, here's the approach. Mm -hmm. But what they do have is multiple centuries of trial and error. Um, when something didn't work, okay, and then they tried something else. And that probably worked a little better. They kept that. Um, and then somebody said, yeah, but, that, but maybe this will work better. It might have, it might have not. But um, the ability to discard mm -hmm. over multiple generations of winemakers um, what didn't work and keep what did is what makes Burgundy the most interesting Pinot Noir region today. 200 years from now, um, when the same process occurs again and again and again here in California, in New Zealand, in Tasmania, uh, even in Canada. Mm -hmm. And who knows what the effects of global warming will bring. Uh, and we don't know the answer to that either. This may turn everything I said on its head. Um, but presuming that we manage to get things under reasonable control, and the old playbook is still valid for the centuries to come, then we may find that Oregon makes the best Pinot Noir in the world. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I think there's great potential here. Um, but at the moment, what Burgundy, or I should say what Oregon, just, just to choose Oregon since we're here, um, lacks that Burgundy has is a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. Um, but the Burgundians didn't have it a couple hundred years ago either. Uh, you know, they were wandering around in the dark. Uh, they got it right, or at least they are the reference standard today. You know, but that's not necessarily mean that they're going to be the reference standard uh, 100, 200 years from now. We just don't know. Um, and the other uh, major, major, major wild card in all of this is climate change. Mm -hmm. Um, it could very well be that Burgundy gets to be too warm. Yeah. Um, already you start to see flabby whites. Um, more often than you see the tight, steely uh, whites that made the region famous. Um, Burgundy has also been an enormous, out of all the wine regions in the world, uh, the one that has benefited the most, in my opinion, from the global warming that has occurred is Burgundy, red Burgundy. Um, all of a sudden, because you go back even 30 years, you had minimum two, three, four vintages where the fruit just didn't get ripe enough to make anything interesting. Um, technological progress, in particular with sorting tables, you can now, you can't get caviar, but you can at least get something that you can do okay with. Mm -hmm. But 30 years ago, they didn't have the anti-rot sprays, they didn't have the treatments um, that they have today, and they certainly didn't have the sorting tables. Um, it was pretty much if Mother Nature gave, you took. Um, today we're a whole lot more selective about which, what we choose to keep. Um, there are reasons for that w that we could get into, but uh, as a practical matter, um, you now achieve probably a nine out of 10 vintages which had we gone back in time 50 years and said in the 2010s, nine out of 10 vintages will give you sufficiently ripe fruit, they would have thought you were from outer space because it wasn't possible then. You know, when you go through every decade, it was about three vintages. I mean, in the first decade, 1900 gave you okay fruit, four, six, seven maybe. Uh, I could go through decade by decade um, for each year and say yes, no, at the limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say that on average you had three good vintages. You know, and that's why the Negociants hated 
um, the AOC system because they basically said, okay, we have three vintages a year we can sell without cutting it with something or even another vintage in Burgundy, which is why they put that rule in place. Mm -hmm. Um, which and they do the same thing here and in California and elsewhere and it makes sense if you're producing large volumes but 85% has to be what the vintage says it is mm -hmm. so you have 15% that you can you know kind of uh, make a sauce with uh, but the argument that they had was what do I do with the other seven vintages that didn't get ripe and what am I supposed to do with that mm -hmm. um, and it's a powerful argument because um, eating's good uh, and to eat, you have to sell, and so it's one of the reasons that today that the small grower has supplanted largely the power of the negociant, um, where in the old days the only way to get rid of a lot of bad wine was to make a big swimming pool of it mm -hmm. and have just enough good to drown out the effects of the bad. Um, so they served uh, a purpose that is less necessary today. So what are some of the biggest challenges to you as you are going about writing? What are, what are the biggest challenges? What are your biggest obstacles? Um, well, writing tasting notes uh, loses its novelty pretty quickly. Um, you know, after you've written the first seven or eight hundred, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to get up for the next uh, seven or eight hundred <laughs> um, because typical issue of Burgown has between 1,500 and 2,000 in each one, uh, you know, which means that they run between 200 and 250 pages, small tape, large margins, at no photos, no ads. You know, so it's a lot of, of writing and to keep the freshness of the approach is probably the hardest thing to do day after day after day. Um, that said, I always remind myself that the readers are paying me good money and they're not paying for me to be lazy. <laughs> uh, so you have to be your own taskmaster. Um, working for yourself is a wonderful, wonderful luxury because you can construct your own schedule and if you just don't feel like it one day, you just don't feel like it. Um, but there is always, having done this now for 17 years, um, I'm also aware that in the back of my mind, there's a little message saying, yeah, but you got to do twice as much tomorrow. Mm. Um, or figure out ways to make up the time where you decided to go goof off, go to a ball game, go to whatever. You know, it's great to have that flexibility, but there's no free lunch. Mm. You, know, you work for yourself, you work for yourself. Mm. Um, you can't just say, here, you know, somebody else go do this. Um, so I would say that's probably the, the biggest challenge. Um, the other is just collecting the information. It takes, uh, a, a lot of people envision this as, hey, you know, you go to a winery, you know, you, you, you talk to some nice people and knock back a couple of glasses, jot down a couple of notes and Bob's your uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it, uh, a typical day for me is 12 to 14 hours um, from the time I leave the house before I get back. There's a break at lunch, uh, which I never drink, just water. Uh, because you've got to stay focused. You know, if you have the ability um, through what you say to affect someone's livelihood, they expect you to show up sober. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a critic, I certainly won't cite the name, uh, but towards the end of his career, um, people used to say, could Mr. So-and-so come in the morning? Because by the afternoon, he was already in his cups. And there's a strong temptation when you have um, lots of good wine being proffered, you know, to swallow rather than spit. Um, but people talk, and I not only is the independence important, but the professionalism is important. Mm -hmm. You arrive on time. You do your utmost to understand the challenges that that grower um, confronted during that year. You try and understand it, why, if the wines aren't perhaps quite as good as what you're used to seeing, why? Because it's not necessarily incompetence or even just bad decision making. You know, it's always easy to second guess after the fact, but um, wine making is like golf. You don't get a second shot at it. You, know, you, you have the fruit, you intuitively judge the potential of that fruit 
and you make your decisions accordingly. Now, if you goof, uh, make an error in judgment, you can do things that might round off the edges, but if you miss, you miss. Mm -hmm. And the idea that every winemaker is perfect, um, every vintage all the time with every wine, that's simply not true. And it's not easy sometimes to say that Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so um, didn't produce the quality that I'm used to seeing. Um, it's never personal, uh, but at the same time, I'm not being paid by the wineries. Uh, I'm being paid by my readers for an honest opinion. I try and, and present it so that it's fair uh, to say that yeah. quality is not uh, what I'm used to seeing. On the other hand, I enjoy giving compliments. You know, oh, the quality is great this year. It's much, it's much nicer to to give compliments than not, but if everybody gets an A, uh, are you really offering the service and the discrimination of quality that you've promised your readers? Mm -hmm. um, there are a few vintages where people joke and say, if you made bad wine in this vintage, you should find another line of work. You know, sometimes a vintage gives fruit that is so perfect that almost everybody makes at least good wine. Those are fun to write about because you don't really have to say, yuck. Uh, but in spite of everything I just said a minute ago about Burgundy um, having benefited from global warming more than other regions, it doesn't mean that every vintage is perfect. It just means that they're more consistent than they used to be. Um, and it used to be wildly inconsistent. So it's better. Um, but the idea that everybody makes great wine every vintage not so much. So you focused early on, on on Burgundy, on Pinot Noir. What is it to you that makes Pinot Noir special? Well, it, it has as a great variety the ability to do something that, in my opinion, no other great variety can do, be it red or white, which is to deliver power without weight. Um, usually, um, something that is intense and powerful and deli delivers a great deal of flavor authority and does so with weight. Mm -hmm. Pinot Noir dances across your palate. It's a ballerina. It can be made to be a weightlifter, mm -hmm. but it's never happy about it. Um, and so getting that balance where Pinot um, can be powerful um, without losing what makes it so beautiful, which is its elegance and refinement. Um, that's the trick. Um, it's easy to go too far. Um, and, and this is something that is very, very interesting. I mean, you know, look at um, 2011 here in Oregon, which by most accounts was a fairly difficult vintage. And when you are confronted with fruit that you know is less than perfect, what do you do? Um, I find that young winemakers um, tend to think that the genius is here in their hands uh, as opposed to the dirt. Um, our discussion of terroir, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but to use a baseball analogy, if it's two outs and it's no balls and two strikes and you're still string swinging for the fences, you're probably going to strike out. Mm -hmm. Most people do. Mm -hmm. And my point is that if you have fruit that you know um, is less than perfect in some way and you're still going to try and make the greatest wines you've ever made, chances are you're going to miss. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I think, a sign of winemaking maturity when people say, I I'm going to get at least a single and maybe a double out of this because I have to shorten up uh, my swing. <laughs> I'm just not going to swing as hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but reputations for consistency are in winemaking are built on the fact that you never make bad wine. You may not make great wine every year, but you make something that's good. Mm -hmm. um, your clients are not disappointed. Um, and that, I think, is much harder to do than the circumstance I described a moment ago, which is you have perfect fruit. It's easy to make a really, really good wine. Um, when you have something like 2011 in Oregon or um, 2004 in Burgundy, the best winemakers shorten up their swing and say, ah, it's not perfect, but we're going to make something that's palatable anyway. And that intuitive judgment 
and the discipline to say, all right, it's just going to be one of those years. Not everybody is capable of doing that. I don't know that I'd be good at it. Uh, so I admire those who are, uh, just to be able to say, yeah, perhaps next year will be better, we hope. Uh, and, but that, as simple and as self-evident as that might sound, it's actually less common than you might think. Um, so that would be my, uh, my response to that. So in your, if you picture the perfect Pinot Noir, describe it, what are the qualities of a perfect Pinot Noir? Well, a perfect Pinot Noir um, is a reflection of the terroir that grew it. Um, I tend to, it's simplistic, but I think it actually is a good image to think of each wine as a triangle, um, where the three points of the triangle uh, represent the vintage, the terroir, and the winemaking signature, mm -hmm. um, which is never neutral. Um, and for any uh, given wine, the vintage portion can be almost invisible, or if you get an extreme year, it can dominate most of the, uh, the triangle. I mean, ultimately, the effect of the vintage and the, the winemaking signature, which tends to be more prominent young um, than with age, both of those tend to dissipate in their influence, and the effect of the terroir um, generally comes to dominate um, the triangle. Uh, so the first part of the answer to your question would be when. Mm -hmm. um, you're more likely, just based on the way I described it, you're more likely to see signature and vintage young, mm -hmm. um, but you're also more likely to see um, the varietal effects of Pinot Noir, um, those sort of bright, depends on the vintage, but bright fruit um, flavors, some tannin, uh, but often more fruit than depth. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what happens with time is, like I said, signature and vintage effect tend to um, fade into the background with, uh, with time. The effect of the terroir becomes more pronounced, um, but also you start to lose um, the Pinot Noir fruit to be replaced by secondary and more complex um, elements. Perhaps the most important element of all, though, irrespective of terroir, vintage, and winemaking signature is balance. Um, what Pinot Noir does, just as I mentioned a moment ago, is to, to develop or to deliver um, intense flavors, but seeming with no weight. Mm -hmm. um, it's never tiring to drink. Um, there is a sweetness um, that Pinot Noir develops with age that people find um, beguiling. You know, whether it's velvet, whether it's silk, um, you just can't believe the delicacy but with richness, with flavor impact. Um, Cabernet can't do that. Uh, it can be wonderfully complex. Um, you might, maybe, if you were feeling charitable, describe it as elegant, but generally speaking, you still got punch. And I'm not saying that's bad, by the way. Um, you know, if you are looking to, to marry that up with uh, a big barbecued steak, you might rather have that than something that's a little more delicate with your, say, roast salmon, hence the salmon bake, uh, it's not an accident, uh, or something that's not quite as robust. Lamb is, uh, I mean, everybody talks about Cabernet-based wines and lamb. I actually think Pinot Noir goes even better. Um, but, you know, you get, uh, if you look at the hierarchy of power, you're kind of Syrah and then Cabernet and then probably Pinot Noir. And the food choices that go with that reflect uh, that, that power, robustness, and generally tannic capability. Because when you look at Pinot Noir as a variety, the skins are relatively thin compared to certainly Syrah or Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And most of the tannic uh, structure comes from the skins. And so if the skins are thinner, you can get um, th thick skin Pinot Noir in very, very warm vintages. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but generally that comes at the deformation of the aromatic profile. It's less elegant because it's much riper. Again, there's no right or wrong in any of this because some people like really ripe Pinot Noir. I mean, there was in the late 1990s, early 2000s, um, that was almost cult Pinot Noir. <laughs> super ripe, 16%, uh, you know, super long hang times with very, very thick skins. You know, they were basically making Cabernet out of Pinot. Uh, had a different taste profile, but it was that, you know, sort of bodybuilding uh, mm. Pinot on steroids. Um, happily, that didn't last for very long. Um, so, you know, with today's winemaking, you can, in my opinion, deform almost any grape variety to have it resemble something else if that's what you want. But, you know, basically selling Pinot Noir as Cabernet, it's like just, you're just better off making Cabernet mm -hmm. um, than trying to make Pinot Noir be something it really doesn't want to be. So you touched on this a second ago when you were talking about your kind of daily schedule, but I'm curious how many wines you taste in a given week or, or given month. It depends on whether I'm on the road tasting or whether I'm tasting uh, in my office. Uh, we generally do between three and four cases a week if I'm in my office, uh, but in a perfect day, which is never exact, but when I'm out on the road, it's 75 wines a day. Um, again, that occurs, I would say, in terms of actual tasting, 12 hours. Um, I do generally, I, I, it depends on the range of wines, because people always ask, and how many visits a day do you do? But it's less a function of uh, the visits than the number of wines on that given day and the idea is to shoot for 75 wines but if you were to try and make it a typical day sometimes it is sometimes it isn't but it would be five domains uh, and 15 wines um, five times 15 75 mm -hmm. and like I said that's 10 12 hours of work plus the two hours at lunch because it's lunch hours there not lunch hour <laughs> <laughs> um, but that would be um, and then after long experience, I, I don't work on weekends anymore uh, from the standpoint of tasting. Um, it's, most people think that tasting is a physical activity, and it is to a certain extent, but it's also an intensely intellectual sounds hoity-toity, but there is a mental aspect to it, especially with the approach that I try and use of breaking a wine down and reconstructing it. Mm -hmm. You have to be engaged. It's not an activity to do when you're tired um, because it's just too much work. And if all you're there is to do is um, very nice. <laughs> Again, that's not the readership I try and serve. Uh, and frankly, uh, it's not that I'm a choir boy anymore, but I'm a whole lot more disciplined now than I was when I started, because I didn't know any better. Uh, but I learned early on that the, the job's not much fun when you're tired. I mean, doing almost anything when you're tired is not much fun. Uh, but again, when you have the ability to affect someone's livelihood, you owe them a minimum of professionalism. Mm -hmm. And part of that professionalism is to show up uh, with energy. You're engaged. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to understand. Because ultimately, what, and this is a, a loaded way to express it, and I appreciate that, but you owe your clients the right answer, whatever the right answer might be. But the right answer um, is not criticizing something that, that doesn't deserve to be criticized, or by contrast, the right answer is not saying this is wonderful when it's not. Because in both cases, what suffers is my credibility. Mm -hmm. If I say something isn't good and people don't buy it, all, inevitably that wine will show up someplace. And they'll say, I wonder what Meadows thought. And they'll say, wow, he really lambasted that. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> um, so at a minimum, they think you missed, and you may well have. Um, but secondly, they may be annoyed that they didn't buy something um, that they might have enjoyed buying. On the other hand, and this is even worse, is that you say, wow, that's the cat's meow. You know, makes your socks roll up and down. 
And so they run out and buy a couple of cases, and they find it's not very good. Uh, they're not happy with the winery, but they're really not happy with me. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I get into a dispute, you know, dispute's a strong word, but let's say a discussion about what I had to say about a producer's wines, and they're not happy or they thought I was um, unduly severe, I explain what I just explained, that there's nothing in the game for me to be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, because in both cases I lose. Mm -hmm. So the only way for me to maintain my readership and to give them a reason to come back um, is to give more good advice than bad advice. And so I tell these guys, look, I'm, I appreciate that you may not have liked what I had to say, but when you say that the only way I win is for me to give good advice, and if that advice sometimes says, eh, it's not so hot. It is what it is. Um, on the other hand, it's never personal. Uh, and once in a while, you'll get somebody that'll take it to the nth extreme. He says, I don't understand. You never seem to like my wines. Uh, how is it that I can make wines that will please you? And I say, oh, simple, make better wines. <laughs> now, that's flip, and it's not necessarily very diplomatic, but at some point, that is the bottom line. So, you know, I'm. People, it's only natural. It's like going uh, to your first grader's uh, parent-teacher conference. I say, hey, you know, Johnny's not doing so well here because he can't pay attention. Uh, that's not what we want to hear. Um, but maybe Johnny needs uh, just some help. You know, calm down, pay attention, whatever it might be. But it's the same thing I'd say to a winemaker. You know, the wines are his kids. Um, but it's not my fault. Uh, that I didn't like that more. Because winemakers tend to think that it's your fault because you didn't like my wines. Mm -hmm. And I turn it around and say, well, actually, it's your fault. Because, uh, again, there's nothing in this for me to say something that, uh, that isn't good when it is. Mm -hmm. And that is a hard lesson, but the more intelligent or at least the more open-minded among them generally say, you know, he's right. Um, now, whether they choose to change anything is something else. I mean, there are people I don't visit anymore mm -hmm. because we couldn't come to an accord over what the wines, quote unquote, uh, should be. And I hate uh, going someplace, spending an hour and a half tasting through a typical range of wine, spending, it takes me about the same amount of time to write up a domain with the introduction, this is what the winemaker thought about mm -hmm. uh, this vintage, this is how he reacted, he or she reacted, uh, that it took me to taste the wines. So I got three hours invested in a typical winery or a typical domain, and, and to sit there for 15 wines in a row saying, this is not so good, this is acceptable, no fun in that. Uh, and I don't think it serves the reader especially well, even though some will argue, well, I, it's just as important to know what not to buy as to what to buy. But I, I make the counter argument to say that if it's not recommended, um, by definition, um, you know, it's not worth your, uh, mm -hmm. not worth your attention. Um, so these are the realities of the business, because it really is, the, the, the business is three parts. Um, there's competence in tasting. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to be uh, the greatest taster in the world, but you do have to be competent. Um, you do have to understand wine faults. Uh, and then you can choose how to present them. In fact, that's worth a, uh, a brief comment. Second thing you have to do is to be able to express uh, your sentiments about the wine in a fashion that resonates with your readership. Um, you know, we talked about objectivists, subjectivists. Mm -hmm. uh, every journalist has their own style as to how they choose to present um, their tasting notes. Buy, don't buy. There are some, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, one star, three star, no stars. Uh, you know, there's lots of, of ways to do that. Uh, but it, it has to be competent. And then third thing uh, is to be able to be a certain to have a certain amount of diplomacy, not only with readers that are happy with your recommendations, that thankfully doesn't happen very often, but occasionally it does, or I don't understand this, 
And so you have to be able to explain. On the other side, uh, because you're the man in the middle, um, the producers, as I just described, that aren't happy with what you had to say, uh, or even those that say, wow, thank you so much. And I always am quick to point out, I said, it wasn't me, it was your wines. Um, I said, it's, it's always nice to give compliments, uh, but it was your wines that I gave the compliments to. You were behind it, you know, so you get secondary credit, but it was your wines. Um, and I think that's really important that they understand that this wasn't some personal gesture. Um, it was their wines that spoke. Um, I was going to... Um, how to present. How to present. You were talking about how to present wine. Um, yeah, it, it... You know, how you choose to break things down uh, or not um, is... I think part of the journalistic craft, um, and also who you're writing for. Mm -hmm. um, there are those who simply say, just, just, just tell me, buy it or don't buy it. And, all right, well, that's an approach. And if you don't care why you're buying it, um, but it's good, I'll knock yourself out. I mean, you know, there is uh, the old joke uh, where a guy buys a case of Chardonnay, goes home, hates it, takes the 11 bottles back. Uh, and says, you know, I didn't like this. I, I'd like a credit to get something else. And uh, the store clerk says, okay, but you know, this got 95 points. And the guy says, oh, in that case, I'll take two more cases. <laughs> uh, which is indicative of somebody who's not, not only not confident in their own palate, but they're buying on external validation. Mm -hmm. In my particular case, um, given how tightly allocated uh, production in Burgundy is, as well as, especially here in Oregon. You know, you've got wineries that are making a couple of barrels or something. So the consumer necessarily can't go taste for themselves, for the most part. And so what I'm offering is less a, a source of external validation than something that the reader can't replicate on their, on their own. They, because they can't go taste. Uh, and so it's either an opinion or no opinion, um, which is really um, buying blind. So that's one of the reasons why a publication like Berghound has value to the readership, because it offers them something that they can't do otherwise. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm pretty sure that Zinfandel Hound wouldn't work because the cost of a mistake isn't high enough to justify somebody subscribing to something that targeted, especially and to pay very much for it. Uh, whereas when the cost of higher in Pinot or higher in Burgundy starts at a buck uh, and can easily go to a thousand or even more in a few cases, um, you know, you, you wander into wherever Whole Foods, you pick up a 10 or $15 bottle of wine and you don't like it, uh, you're not happy, but it's not the end of the world. You lay out a hundred or a couple mm -hmm. and you don't like that, now you're a whole lot less happy. Mm -hmm. And so what I provide is access uh, that they can't replicate mm -hmm. as well as a certain safety net uh, underneath which they can buy with more confidence than they might otherwise be able to. Sure. So you mentioned earlier that you found that Burgundy is still like the standard bearer in terms of Pinot Noir, but is there a region, what, what region most excites you? What Pinot Noir region most excites you right now? I think there are two that uh, have at least to this point, demonstrated the most potential, and I would say it's Oregon and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. um, Oregon, I, I think, is really, really fascinating because I get the sense that we're only just scratching the surface. Um, all of what I was talking about with terroir exploration, um, getting the right um, clonal selections, how to farm that, um, and also the whole uh, consumer education aspect because 
for the most part, even sophisticated consumers, if you went and said, you know, what distinguishes uh, Yam Hill Carlton from Dundee Hills, from Jalen Mountains, there aren't many that could give you a coherent answer. Mm -hmm. They have maybe a sense. Mm -hmm. All right, you know, Ribbon Ridge maybe is a little more elegant. Uh, Dundee's going to give you more robust uh, flavors. But that's probably about as far as they can take it. Whereas when I gave the opening remarks yesterday, uh, I said, you know, if you want, if you're in the mood for Von Romane or you're in the mood for Volnay, there's only one place to go and get that somebody that makes one of those two. Mm -hmm. And so, in addition to the terroir prospecting um, that's going on right now here, which is to say new vineyard sites, how to plant it, how to farm it, uh, and then to be able to see the characteristics that develop with time and bottle, the other side of that for the producers is to educate their clients, make sure that, that the clients are going with them on the journey. Um, because what you want, ultimately, in my opinion, and this is the message I delivered yesterday, which is the only sustainable competitive advantage that any wine region has, is to create something that can't be found anyplace else. Burgundy has managed to do that. That's its sustainable competitive advantage. If you want Vone, if you want Volne, only one place to get it. Mm -hmm. And the message I delivered yesterday was, um, and I, this will become finer. I mean, Yamhill, Dundee, um, Chehalem Mounds is still too big um, for it to have a precise mm -hmm. um, flavor profile, flavor definition, style of wine. But, you know, Shea Vineyards, for example, has already uh, done a pretty good job of establishing a certain idea in consumers' heads as to what that is. Um, so it's a matter of time, and that's why I say that in addition um, to the 150, 200, you know, whatever the number turns out to be, uh, of where we get the prospecting, um, the fruit, and the farming down uh, to a point where we've eliminated a lot of the errors and are now able um, to produce in theory at least, um, to realize the potential that's here, whatever that potential is, and we're still trying to figure out what that is, you gotta take the consumer with you. Because um, one of the things that the Burgundians had, at least up until uh, the time of the French Revolution, is that all those mistakes were free in a sense, um, because they were owned by the church, they could use the mistakes in their rituals, you know, as sacramental wine, et, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't a complete bust. Um, post-1789 in Burgundy, and certainly is the case today here or any emerging wine region, is that when you make mistakes, what do you do? You still got to stay in the game. In other words, you have to be economically viable, um, which means that risks are taken more carefully, as well they should be. Because um, if you um, plant in the wrong place, it's expensive. You know, it's probably putting aside what it costs to actually acquire the land. You probably got fifty thousand an acre of just hard costs. Um, you know, to get your vines in to trellis it, if you're going to drip irrigate or not. Um, you know, if you've got to clear the land, you know, all those costs are some cost before you ever get your first harvest. And then maybe it's good, maybe it's great, maybe it's awful. Uh, so it, it, prospecting's not free. It sounds like, hey, you, know, you just go do it. Um, but it's not free. Um, and while if you've chosen well, you're probably not gonna make anything terrible, but if the idea is to find the new world's equivalent of Latash, where is that? Um, and that takes real care, it takes money. Um, it takes attention to detail, and it takes time. That's why I always tell the New World winemakers, you know, I ticked off all the things that, uh, that they have, that the Burgundians have, but the one thing they don't have is time. Can't buy it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can't just make your vines 35 years old. And the first wine that you make from fully mature fruit, you can't say, okay, let's fast forward 15 years into the future and find out whether this wine is as good as I hope for or not. And so those are the things that are, I think, frustrating for people that are going out today saying uh, that that piece of dirt looks really promising, you know, but is it? You know, 50 years from now, your kids know whether uh, 
you had a good eye or, or not. What are the biggest changes you've seen in the Oregon industry since you started following it more closely to now? Um, a couple of things. I, I think uh, they've gotten better at uh, marketing their wines, which is a good thing. Um, you start to see more emphasis now on AVAs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to remember uh, that most of the AVAs are 10 years old, 12. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a lot of time for even people who are paying attention to know what Yamhill versus Dundee versus you know, all the AVAs that are around uh, the Willamette Valley, that's not very much time for people to understand what are those characteristics. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd bet it's one consumer in 100 um, that could sit down and give you more than a cursory description. But that's not surprising. Mm -hmm. In fact, one out of 100 might be generous in the sense that these have only existed for 10, 12 years. You know, people have been talking about you know, the, the first great book uh, written on the vineyards of Burgundy was 1831. I mean, uh, it's not too far from 200 years ago where those characteristics were already pretty well understood. And the consumers came with that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say that the work here is twofold. You've got work on the producer side of finding out what these terroirs have to say. Um, for better or worse, because not all terroirs have something interesting to say. I mean, as I'm fond of saying, it just makes an extreme point. I have terroir in my backyard in Los Angeles. It's not good terroir. It has nothing to say, but it's there. Here, um, the terroirs do have something to say, but what are the most interesting ones? And have they all been discovered yet? Probably not. And so there's that work. But then the Oregon Wine Board, me, other people writing about um, Oregon Pinot Noir and the producers themselves in their tasting rooms, the people that they employ to talk to the people that come to taste their wines, to walk them through the individual characteristics mm -hmm. um, and to separate out because it's, it's perfectly natural when you're not sure about the quality of your terroir because you yourself don't have an enormous amount of familiarity with it. It takes a long time. Um, I can name off um, most of probably the top 250, 300 terroirs in Burgundy with no difficulty, but I've been doing that for 40 years, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that happens overnight. Um, and so I think that it's really, really important not simply to make the wine, you've got to explain it to the consumer. This is why Jehalem is different from this. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an um, educational role to be played by everybody that's in it, me included, mm -hmm. uh, or I should say journalists um, in general, is to explain. Mm -hmm. um, but to explain with humility because we don't know that we've seen the, the final picture. It hasn't been painted yet. And in fact, I ascribe the process of doing a jigsaw puzzle backwards, meaning you know, there's no image. Mm -hmm. You're just looking at shapes and trying to connect them in a way that ultimately makes a, uh, a square. But the final word um, hasn't been created yet. And so it's a little bit of chicken or the egg. And that's what terroirs do. And um, one of the things that's even harder is that we're talking about AVAs, but if we ascribe that to, uh, to Burgundy, not all Gevray tastes the same. And so you can talk about sort of a, a prototypical Gevray, but within Gevray, there are lots of different expressions. And so that will be the next level of work is to then say, well, this vineyard gives this. And there is a tendency right now for a winery to talk about itself as opposed to its terroirs. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier if you have all of that vineyard. Um, there are a few monopoles in Burgundy, but for the most part, they are shared. And that makes it easier in the sense of education. Because if you've got 10 different people making wine from that particular vineyard, well, you've got 10 different advocates 
talking about that. Whereas if you're the only one, mm -hmm. um, it's easy for you to control the expression. On the other hand, you are a marketing force of one. Uh, and what I hope doesn't happen here, even though it won't surprise me if it does, is that people talk about their winery, which is perfectly natural, um, because you, know, you want people to come back and be loyal to you uh, as your winery, but ultimately, uh, at a minimum, you've got to talk about what your terroir has to say, and it's not just winemaking. Sure. And that is a delicate dance. Because again, you gotta sell your product. You wanna sell it for as much as you can. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with being a capitalist and a winemaker uh, at the same time. Because it enables you, if you make money in your operation, it enables you to invest in higher quality equipment, maybe expand your vineyards. It enables you to do lots of positive things. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a delicate dance to establish the identity of your vineyards as opposed to your winery. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting. And that is something that, again, I talked about, you know, is the genius here. You know, what if your winemaker dies tomorrow, God forbid, or you yourself, and now it's somebody else? What if they're less gifted as a winemaker? Um, much rather have the, the genius there sure. uh, so that irrespective of who's making the wine, um, as long as they're good, uh, they don't have to be great, they just need to be competent, uh, you're more likely to produce something interesting if the fruit that you have to begin with is interesting. It's much, much easier. Mm -hmm. you know? That's having terroir and talking about it. So what do you see in the next 10, 20, 50 years for Oregon? Well, there's no reason to think that the future is anything but extremely bright. Um, I think that there are, are a variety of factors that inure to the benefit of Pinot Noir in general versus almost, if not all other varieties, then certainly a great number of them. Many of the wines, I don't know what the percentage is, but some very high percentage, probably 80% or so, of all the world's wines are blended, as opposed to being a unique expression based on one variety. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you look at Bordeaux, that's five. Um, you know, Syrah has, has several. Um, most Cabernet has something else in it, and even a lot of, of Pinot Noir, less so today, but even some Pinot Noir has some Syrah blended in or, or something else. But I think that the technological wines uh, give interest to Pinot Noir because it's not a technological wine. Mm -hmm. It's one expression, and Pinot Noir uh, at least among the cognoscente, is not viewed as Pinot Noir. I mean, the Burgundians, not that they're the only arbiters here, but they would tell you they don't make Pinot Noir. Um, it's a vector. It's simply the medium that goes from below the ground and just above it to something in the glass. Um, but the expression is Richebourg or Romani Saint Vivant or Clover Joe. Uh, and Pinot Noir is incidental to the process. Um, it's the magician, but it's incidental to the, the process. And I think that it is this authenticity, this perception of authenticity um, that Pinot Noir doesn't like manipulation. It is what a friend of mine likes to call a lie detector. <laughs> it is very hard um, to do something to Pinot Noir and hide it. Um, because it is so exquisitely transparent. Um, and that's why it's a vector um, for the soil, it's a vector for how it's farmed, and it's a vector for how it's made. And even though I mentioned that the cult of Pinot Noir that was present in the mid to late 
1990s, even the beginning of the 2000s, that was super ripe, super rich, super alcoholic, mm -hmm. tended to be very, very woody. You know, that's all past because people don't want um, manipulated wine. They know Pinot Noir won't give you that mm -hmm. naturally. Doesn't like it. Uh, I don't think it serves the grape well. Uh, and ultimately, the wines are not very interesting either. I mean, that's, that's a point of view. Um, you know, those that bought those wines and like them, and uh, in certain cases, there's a few out there that still people will spend three, four hundred bucks to have them. That's not my vision of Pinot Noir beauty, but who am I to say for, for <laughs> others? I, I have no such pretensions. But I do think that when you look at the sea of technological wines, Pinot Noir, you can't do that and get away with it. It shows. And I think people are attracted to something that they feel as though is authentic. Um, all of that is to say that I think that that lesson has been learned here, mm -hmm. um, just as it has mostly in California. Mm -hmm. um, not completely, but mostly. And as a consequence, I don't see anything but really good things for um, Oregon in general, but certainly Pinot Noir producers here. Plus, it's a really exciting time here. You know, you go and talk to, to people, you can feel the energy. You know, they're exploring. Their vineyards are achieving a certain age. Uh, and people are now installed, meaning that they've largely paid off some of their facilities. You know, they're not hanging on um, by their fingernails trying to make the next um, mortgage payment. Uh, now, all of a sudden, they can ask, what do my vines have to say? Um, and that, I think, is a really exciting phase, especially if they take the consumers with them. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, at the risk of uh, overselling things, that, you know, the future's so bright here, you've got to wear shades. Um, I, I think it's a really, really exciting period. Um, I would say that New Zealand uh, could say the same thing. I'm less optimistic about Australia and Pinot Noir. I'm not sure what to think of most parts of Canada. I think there are a couple of areas in California that show great promise, uh, but not nearly as much as the state would have you believe. Uh, I, th I think that much of where they're trying to grow Pinot is just too warm uh, to preserve the acidity because that acidity, it's interesting in journalistic parlance uh, that acidity almost became a dirty word. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas today, um, balanced wines that have that bright acidity that enable them to go well at the table, um, mm -hmm. I think are uh, much more popular. That's what gets drunk. I mean, you know, you go to a pole style event where you've got 50 bottles on the table, uh, two thirds of them are half full. And so whether or not it's the best labels or not, the bottles that are empty are the ones that consumers said, that's good with what I'm having. It's not always evident, you know, when you've got something that's really expensive, but generally half a glass of it, you kind of, because it's tiring to drink. Um, it's impressive, it's robust, it's dramatic, but ultimately it's not what people want to sit down and have um, more than one glass of. So um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the future here is, if I was going to be someplace, I'd like to be here. Yeah. It's good to hear. It's yeah. So what, and what brings you here, obviously, is IPNC and not, is not your first time here. I'm curious, sort of, just sort of your general thoughts on IPNC and its evolution in the last 30 years. Well, I don't know about the last 30 years. I can only speak to it since 2003. That mm -hmm. was my first year, but I've been here every year since. And I, I find the level of knowledge continues to go up in terms of the people that attend. Um, you know, it's not free to attend. I, I don't think it's terribly expensive either. That's not a, um, a critique. But it's just sufficiently expensive that it attracts real enthusiasts. Um, you know, because if it was 200 bucks to come, everybody would come, or most people would come. The money is enough where people that come 
tend to be very passionate. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows, um, has been kind enough to invite me uh, to do a seminar almost every year. Mm -hmm. And I can gauge the sophistication of the questions. Um, now part of that's the subject matter in any given year. Um, the questions are pretty good. <laughs> <coughs> and, <coughs> ah, sorry. So as a, as a consequence, um, that is at least an indirect gauge of the level of knowledge that's sitting out in the room before you. Um, overall, too, I think the uh, approach to go to sort of a, a university of Pinot Noir enables a variety of topics to be presented that might otherwise be thought of as a bit too geeky. <laughs> um, you know, my topic this year, for example, is the effect of vintages. You know, on the one hand, you could say, well, self-evident. On the other hand, if you dig below the surface, there's a lot of there there to explore. And my seminar yesterday, there were 175 people. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many will be there today, but it's a lot of folks just to come and taste six wines. Um, they were really interested in digging below the surface and understanding you know, this vector that I talked about with a triangle. What is the role of vintage? How does a given terroir react in some vintages but not others? You know, if you've got hydric stress um, because there's no topsoil, that terroir is going to react differently in water deficit vintages as opposed to something that's got deep clay where you've got water reserves. But that terroir in a rainy vintage might be a whole lot less interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, so those kinds of nuances, I find interesting that people themselves, people that come, are interested in delving into, you know, shaving the onion <laughs> a little more finely than what might have been the case 15 years ago. So on that note, what is the, what would you say the wine culture is in America right now and, and how is it going to change? That's a good question right there because um, I think that there is a tendency to want to talk about one America. Mm -hmm. you know, politically, um, almost any subject you could name, the idea that you know, 300 and what, 30 million people these days can easily be put into um, one box. Uh, it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that there is a real sophistication in, among American wine consumers, um, even at the level of starting out, because almost everybody can um, cite grape varieties. You know, it's no longer Gallo Hardy Burgundy or, you know, Mountain Chablis. You know, that was a phenomenon of the 60s and 70s. You know, today people can cite off as Infidel and Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, et cetera, et cetera, Pinot Noir. And that's just the first cut. And the, when you look at the typical supermarket today, there's a real selection of wines. And they wouldn't de devote that much floor space to something that wasn't paying its way. And it's paying its way because people like choice. Um, they like different price points too, but they like choice. And so I, I see that continuing. And then if you go to the top 20%, I mean, that's where the um, majority of money is spent. And I see no reason for that to do anything other than grow. Why? Because unlike that was the case in the, say, 50s and 60s, where there was a certain snobbery attached to wine drinking and wine knowledge. You know, you had a martini or a scotch if you were a man, you know, this stuff sitting around drinking a Chablis. Um, that's not the case today. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a mark of sophistication without having that slightly pejorative element of snobbery. Um, to be knowledgeable about wine. Not necessarily to bore somebody to death at the table, uh, but to know your way around a wine list. People admire that. You know, it's no longer you're a sissy. You know, you've got too much time in your hands, you've got too much money. 
uh, that slightly pejorative element that existed for a long time because beer drinkers felt ever so mildly threatened. Uh, I don't perceive that to exist, or if it does, it's much more muted um, than it used to be. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that there is this even if grudging admiration for people who can um, navigate their way ar around a wine list or a wine store and choose something good, that's a quality to be admired as opposed to, hmm. So uh, I think that uh, the culture of wine, the business of wine is alive and well in the US. and absent some you know, global economic depression or some external force that causes everybody to pull back mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, of just buying uh, necessities as opposed to luxuries. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to me, I couldn't imagine going a day without uh, a glass of wine, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be expensive wine. Uh, you know, so necessity is as we define it as is a luxury good but absent some fairly severe external force um, that dampens people's and economic enthusiasm for all kinds of products i see no reason why wine won't continue to flourish so the last question i have for you is going to kind of break it down in two parts and kind of both parts of your job so i'm curious as if you were someone who were entering the time when they wanted to start drinking good wine, how would you suggest they start drinking good wine? Um, well, first of all, find what you like. Um, and then tell yourself, don't stay there. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to, to tell somebody, go find what you don't like. But I'm fairly rabid workout geek and I got a piece of advice one time which is find your comfort zone and get out of it um, and I would say the same thing for a beginning wine person is find what you like and then start experimenting you don't have to like everything but know that your taste won't remain the same um, a lot of times uh, young successful people who now have disposable income will go and build a collection based on what they like right now. Um, and I've heard it I don't know how many hundreds of times where somebody says, you know, I've got this collection of wine that I don't like because uh, my taste has changed so much mm -hmm. um, that it's, it's not for me anymore. I'm not sure what to do with it. Um, some of it's saleable, but much of it isn't. Um, and so I would say collect, but collect lightly. Um, if you happen to like something a lot, well, you'll probably drink it, but at least know that for the next five years, your taste is very likely to change. Um, if you like slightly sweet uh, whites or fruity reds, um, your taste is almost certainly going to go drier. Um, and fruity reds, almost by definition don't have much tannin. So you will probably move to something that has more structure mm -hmm. and therefore is drier. Um, just like sweet whites, German Riesling aside, um, will almost always go drier as well. Um, and that's just an evolutionary process. It, it happens to almost everyone. And therefore, the more you can taste, uh, is a good thing. You know, go, most wine retailers have tastings that you can go to for a variety of wine mm -hmm. for not very much because they want you to come and become more experienced and more knowledgeable. And so taste, 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 taste. Um, and after that, you can subscribe to the Wine Spectator. I think they do a pretty good uh, job of educating. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then after that, if you really get the bug, then you consider a more specialized, you know, whether it's the Wine Advocate or what I do at Berghound or um, Steve Tanzer's. Uh, you know, there are, there are lots of possibilities um, to get information. But that is probably 
a point where you've been doing it for five years, um, where you've got a knowledge base, mm -hmm. and now you want to get quote unquote serious about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's always nice. You could there are tasting clubs uh, you can join. I mean, there's a variety of ways to come at it. Like anything else, it just depends uh, on how much time you want to spend, how much. Uh, in terms of economic resources you want to allocate? In other words, do you want to get better faster? Uh, or are you just kind of on the journey and I'll see if I'm interested or not? I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with concluding that <coughs> I'm interested, but I'm not rabid. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that either. And for the other part of it, if someone wanted to get into wine writing right now, how would you suggest they go about it? Um, Depends on uh, what you want to accomplish, what your goal is. If your goal is uh, to eventually be an independent wine journalist, it's a tough road. Um, to be perfectly honest, it's a tough road. Uh, writing for other publications tends not to pay very well because there are lots and lots of people um, that would like to see their name in print. And so there are people who will write for less than a dollar a word. Um, it's not a way to make a, a living. It's, you can have a hobby. Um, if you want to do what I do, or a few others to establish an independent voice, um, then you have to ask yourself the really, really hard question, which is what do I have to say? And why would somebody pay for that? And that is um, a difficult and humbling question. Because either you have to have an enormous amount of self-confidence, uh, or you have to have a level of expertise that you probably didn't come by accidentally. You've been in the business for a while, or somebody like me that was a rabid geek uh, for 30 years before I decided. Um, to do something, and I was also in a position where if it didn't work, I could go back to finance. I gave myself a two-year window. If it worked, great. If it didn't, it, my skills would not have become so dated mm -hmm. that I could not have gone back to something else. Mm -hmm. And so I had a safety net. If you're young and you're starting out, um, usually what I find is that there is an enormous amount of passion, enthusiasm, energy, but you gotta have something to say. And you gotta give somebody a reason to pay you for it. And usually somebody with five years of experience uh, doesn't know any more than anyone else does, uh, arguably less, but they confuse passion for knowledge. Um, and you have to be a good writer. I mean, you can't just say, wow, you know, I really, really like this. It's, that's nice, but why should I care? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the hook um, that makes somebody care? In my case, our, I already explained um, that I cover an area where the information has economic value to someone. That's why Zinfandel Hound wouldn't work, because the cost of a mistake's not enough. Mm -hmm. So my hook is perspective, doing it for a long time, but also accessing information that most people can't access. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my particular hook. Uh, but if I was in front of a, a group of aspiring um, journalists and or, because what I really am is a publisher. Um, now, my day job is a journalist working for this publisher, but the real <laughs> business is a publishing business. Mm -hmm. And so if that's what someone aspires to do, then you have to ask yourself, what is my value proposition? Um, why uh, would you give me money? There's gotta be a reason, um, at least for you to do it more than once. Uh, the second thing is, what is it that I'm good at? I could be a really good writer, then do I learn to be a good wine taster? Um, most people who write about wine were wine lovers that just happened to have a knack for writing. That was certainly me, because um, I was not a trained journalist. Mm -hmm. Now, I had the enormous, enormous um, benefit, luck, 
uh, to know somebody who is a professional journalist who took an interest in my project mm -hmm. and gave me lots of do's and don'ts. On your life, never do this because your credibility is at risk. Because most people believe that what I'm selling, what any journalist is selling is competence about wine. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That's the second thing that I sell. The most important thing that I sell is credibility independence, that I cannot be bought, um, that when I say something, the reader believes that I believe it. Um, and most youngsters that would be sitting before me um, don't have another source of income, uh, and therefore when the winery says, come stay at, at uh, I'll finance your trip, or you come with a group of journalists, to New Zealand or Australia or Oregon um, or Anderson Valley. I just got an invitation, uh, please come to Anderson Valley, we'll finance your trip, um, we'll pay for the hotel, here's all your meals. Uh, you can disclose that and say uh, this was a finance trip, mm -hmm. uh, but how do I then get the reader to believe that I wasn't influenced in some fashion, even if I've admitted it, mm -hmm. that you know, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have another job, you probably don't have the 3000 that it would take to finance you know, your plane ticket, your hotels, your meals, or at least most of them. Um, so it's not easy um, to put yourself out there because you could very well argue, well, how do I acquire the expertise if I don't go do these things? So it is a bit of a catch-22, and I empathize completely that I was, if not in a unique position, um, I had a window mm -hmm. and decided to take it and lucked out, mm -hmm. uh, or things worked out in any event, however, for whatever reasons. And so I, I think it's a very frustrating <coughs> <coughs> position for young people to be in that would like to do something similar. And beyond that, I'm not sure what I would tell them. <laughs> it's not, I appreciate that is not an especially encouraging message. Um, it's, it's doable, but it's helpful to have some money in your pocket before you go down that road. So you're talking about a consortium of youngsters finding a way to kind of make what you To put together shared expertise mm -hmm. in a way that, um, perhaps combines multimedia with photos um, and education. Because if, there's really two ways to go. Do what I do, super specialized, um, but that takes expertise. It takes a long time to acquire the knowledge. And you have to have the audience for it. And that audience is this. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you look at the, the hierarchy of consumers, most of them are in the middle. <coughs> that are have some expertise, some knowledge, but are looking for more. Mm -hmm. I write for this. People that already are kind of hardcore, mm -hmm. and they're looking for more. Um, but that's not probably the audience that most people can make a living off of. I charge a lot for what I do. Um, and it's to people who have the passion, and therefore they don't mind. Mm -hmm but that's not the audience that most people can write for, if nothing else, just because of the expertise barrier. So probably <coughs> the, <coughs> the best approach is to shoot for the middle where people know that they don't know, but you're gonna help them out and you're gonna do it in a way that makes it easy for them to acquire the knowledge. And that's something, you know, that for, <coughs> for 25, 30, 35 bucks. You know, people will invest that mm -hmm. just to get better, especially if you make it easy for them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the questions I have for you, and it sounds like your voice is going out on you, so. <laughs> <A little bit. laughs> so I'll just say thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. And if there's anything else you'd like to add at the end here, anything I should have asked, any last thoughts or comments? No, um, I think it was pretty thorough.